It is my great pleasure to welcome you to this special event at the University of Dallas. I'm Jonathan Sanford. I'm the president of the university. I know our students know that already, and we've got some alumni here, but some of you are guests, and I thought I would take just a few brief moments to say a few things about the University of Dallas. We, we have a tagline that is well suited to the occasion. We're the Catholic University for Independent Thinkers. We're a place which welcomes debate and critical reflection. The University of Dallas is not a huge university, but we're a full university. We have PhD programs in several humanities disciplines, DBA, many master's degrees, um, two of our signature master programs that have been growing a lot lately are cybersecurity on the one hand and classical education on the other. We're helping in a variety of ways to facilitate the rapid growth of classical education on the K-12 level and are educating the educators in that movement. Um, we're especially well known for our undergraduate program. We've got an extensive and integrated core curriculum. All of our students study a core for two years. The core has a lot of literature, four literature courses, four history courses, two of which are in American uh, history. We have got a number of um, philosophy and theology courses, sciences, art, math, and all of our students study American founding principles and economic theory. The core serves as a kind of foundation for outstanding majors. Um, we shine in a variety of areas, and I know people often look to the results. Our placements are quite exceptional, with students going right into corporate positions, not all of whom were business majors, and many great placements in PhD programs. Um, we have law school and med school placement rates that rival the Ivies. The Rome program, in many respects, is the signature of the undergraduate experience, most of our sophomore undergraduate students spend a semester in Rome where the core curriculum really comes together. They study together, they travel together, they spend 10 days in Greece and do many other things besides. They come back citizens of the world in some measure, but greater in their appreciation for um, the country of their origin. We do indeed cultivate independent thinkers here, and that happens primarily through the classroom experience. The tradition that undergirds our education, the Western intellectual tradition, is one of conflict, one of competition in a certain respect. Those of you who've read Plato know that he is a fierce critic of Homer. Our students start off reading Homer, and then they encounter Plato, and they wonder, what's wrong with Plato? Um, Aristotle has his criticisms of Plato. Augustine has his concerns about all of the Greeks and Romans. And Aquinas tries to synthesize, but at the same time is um, uh, engaged in fierce critical reflection. So our students learn to think these thinkers in conflict with each other. They all become clear thinkers, eloquent writers, persuasive speakers, and um, they make the tradition their own in ways that really prepare them to be creative and innovative and magnanimous in their lives. So again, it's my great pleasure to welcome our friends of the Steamboat, uh, Steamboat Institute here very pleased to welcome each of you. And I want to ask the CEO and co-founder of the Steamboat Institute, Jennifer Schubert Aiken, to come to the podium. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you, President Sanford. It's really great to be on the University of Dallas campus. I have not been here before. Um, one of our board members, we do, we do have something in common with you all, um, 
one of our board members for the Steamboat Institute is on the board of trustees for University of Dallas, Bridget Wagner, who's with the Heritage Foundation. So I know she is really proud of her alma mater, and uh, she was very happy that we were going to um, come to your campus tonight. So wanted to let you know that tonight is actually the second stop in three stops we're doing on this debate tour this week. Um, the resolution being debated in all three is the same, and it's one of the most hotly contested topics of our time. And that resolution, and you're going to be able to um, express your opinion on that, climate science compels us to make large and rapid reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. So we invite all of you to respond with your view yes, no, or undecided before the debate begins using the uh, QR code that's provided, or actually I believe you should have received a text message, um, but you can use your phone to vote. And then before the debate starts, we're going to, uh, screen is right here, we're going to show on the screen the results of, of the poll of your opinions, yes, no, or undecided. And then at the end, you will vote again, and we will show the results again on the screen to see if your opinions have changed. So so uh, that way, you know, we know if, uh, if how, how our debaters are doing and engaging with our audience. But before we begin this evening's debate, I would like to tell you just a little bit about uh, Steamboat Institute's Campus Liberty Tour debates. Last night was the first one in this particular series on this resolution. We were at the University of Maryland in College Park. Um, Dr. Stephen Coonan, who is with us tonight, had a different debate opponent last night. He debated Dr. Daniel Schrag, who is director of the Harvard Center for the Environment. We had a really great debate. We had about 200 people there, and the feedback from the students and everyone who attended was just overwhelmingly positive. So I, I think you're in for a really great experience tonight as well. Tomorrow night, we're going to go up I-35 to Oklahoma City. Um, we will be at Oklahoma State University's new Ham Institute for American Energy, where Dr. Coonan will debate um, Dr. Andrew Dessler from Texas A&M. He's head of the Texas Climate Center at Texas A&M. So if you have any friends up in the Oklahoma City area, please tell them to join us tomorrow night at 530. You can find Find all the information on steamboatinstitute.org. So please share that if you have any friends um, up in Oklahoma City. We would appreciate that. Um, you can watch uh, these debates uh, this week. They'll be on our YouTube channel next week. So if you have friends you couldn't attend, uh, please know that those will be on our YouTube channel. Uh, all of our previous programs from the past 14 years are on our YouTube channel. So we have a wealth uh, of videos there. Our video li library is quite extensive. But just to give you a, a little taste of, of what our Campus Liberty Tour debates, some of the highlights, we have this very brief minute and 25 second uh, video that we would like to show you. Welcome to the Steamboat Institute Campus Liberty Tour. The fact is we're having a proper, full, honest, open debate, and boy, there are going to be differences. It uses state boundaries like the watertight compartments on an ocean You'd never line. have a nationwide recount, but you would under NPV. The truth is, as in a national popular vote system, I am not afraid of my ideas in which we secure a bedrock of social rights, and we can tie this to worker ownership in the sphere of production. What is the capitalist answer Well, to I'm that for problem. competition, I'm for small businesses, and for a lot of things you're saying that you're for, I just think the way to do it is to let people be free. So I'm gonna continue to defend free speech as long as I have the strength to do it, and I'm gonna do it for people who I despise, for people who I disagree with, for people who are uh, I am offended by, the Brexit vote. The free speech. The migration. National popular vote. We are not fake news. Accepting democracy, respectful of other people, regardless of whether you disagree, and one in which it is expected there's civility and trust, rather than incivility and distrust that permeates the country today. Okay, so as um, that last clip there was uh, Wallace Lowe, who at the time was president of the University of Maryland, kind of summed up what the Campus Liberty Tour debates are all about, and that is civilized debate, critical thinking skills, thinking for yourself. So 
one thing I just want to put out there right now is for all of you, regardless of whether you're Democrat or Republican or what your views on climate change and energy policy are, you are always welcome at Steamboat Institute events as long as you're willing to engage in civilized debate. So we always we welcome everyone and just want you to know that. Uh, very briefly, if you are between the ages of 20 and 30, which many of you are, there was a card out here. Um, it's about our Freedom Conference Scholarship. It's an um, annual event we have in Beaver Creek, Colorado every year at the end of August. Um, I, I, there are, I think, well, I know there's at least one person here who uh, attended on scholarship and joined our Emerging Leaders Council this year. And we have several from Texas, actually, who uh, have attended on scholarship. So um, applications for that will be opening in April of next year. And it's a, it's a really great opportunity. So grab one of those cards, or if you have friends who couldn't make it tonight, give them a card. Um, I'd also like to recommend... Uh, recognize a very special group that's here tonight, uh, the Sumner's Foundation Scholars. Could you raise your hands? I think there are a few, few of you guys here. Fantastic. So big thank you to the Sumner's Foundation for uh, sponsoring tonight's debate, and uh, we're very happy to have uh, some of the Sumner's Scholars with us tonight. Um, Steamboat Institute's Campus Liberty Tour debates are gaining in popularity, and that's really an understatement. Um, it's because of the increasing threat of cancel culture. And while cancel culture seems to be taking over in many places, including on college campuses, Steamboat Institute takes the opposite approach. We encourage free and robust debate on even the most contentious issues. So our emphasis, as, as I said before, and it's worth repeating, is always on how to think, not what to think. Think for yourself and don't be afraid to express your opinion. Um, in, in planning the series of debates on climate change and energy policy, we found it especially difficult to find climate experts who are willing to debate Dr. Koonin. Some of the responses we received from well-known climate scientists and academics stated that, that we, the Steamboat Institute, were wildly irresponsible for giving Dr. Koonin a platform, that there's, quote, no room for debate on these issues, and my favorite from a well-known climatologist who is on Reuters' hot list of the world's top climate scientists responded to me in an email, I don't debate climate science. It's a poor way to get at the truth. So we applaud both Dr. Koonin and Dr. Wagner, who I will be introducing to you very shortly, for participating in this debate tonight. Steamboat Institute will continue to give both sides of critical issues a fair and balanced platform to make their case, because we can't maintain our democratic republic if we can't have civilized debate and discourse and people who can think for themselves. Um, and I think that's, that's something we can all agree upon. As a 501c3 nonprofit, nonpartisan organization, Steamboat Institute depends on the generous support of many individuals and businesses and foundations to bring you thought-provoking debates like the ones we are hosting uh, here tonight and uh, at other places this week. So I would like to thank our, our major sponsors for this debate tour, which includes the Sumner's Foundation that's right here in Dallas, the Jack Roth Charitable Foundation, the Diana Davis Spencer Foundation, the Lind and Harry Bradley Foundation, the Snyder Foundation, and the Robert and Judy Newman Family Foundation. And of course, if you enjoy tonight's debate, uh, we would always welcome your financial support. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our speakers and moderator for this evening. So we will have them come in and take the stage. And I will then uh, read their brief bios, and then I'm going to let them take it away. Welcome, panel. Um, okay, so you've heard the resolution, and uh, please vote if you haven't, as I mentioned earlier, and we'll, we'll show those uh, poll resu results here in just a moment before they begin. Arguing the affirmative on tonight's resolution is Granat Wagner. Dr. Wagner is a climate economist at Columbia Business School, where his research, writing, and teaching focus on climate risks and climate policy. Dr. Wagner writes a monthly column for Project Syndicate. His most recent book is Geoengineering the Gamble, published in 2021. He is also the co-author of Climate Shock, published in 2015, which was recognized as a top 15 Financial Times and McKinsey Business Book of the Year for 2015. 
Prior to joining Columbia as a senior lecturer, Dr. Wagner taught at NYU, Harvard, and Columbia. He was the founding executive director of Harvard's Solo Geoengineering Research Program and was lead senior economist for the Environmental Defense Fund and a member of its leadership council. Dr. Wagner has been a term member of the Council on Foreign Relations and is on the board of CarbonPlan.org. Born and raised in Austria, Dr. Wagner moved to the U.S. to attend college. He holds a joint bachelor's magna cum laude with highest honors in environmental science, public policy and economics, and a master's and Ph.D. in political economy and government from Harvard, as well as a master's in economics from Stanford. Let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Granat Wagner. Arguing the negative on tonight's resolution is Stephen Coonan. Dr. Coonan is a leader in science policy, having served as Undersecretary for Science in the U.S. Department of Energy under President Obama. In this role, he was the lead author of the department's strategic plan and the inaugural Quadrennial Technology Review in 2011. With more than 200 peer-reviewed papers in the fields of physics and astrophysics, scientific computation, energy technology, and climate science, Dr. Coonan was a professor of theoretical physics at Caltech, also serving as Caltech's vice president and provost for almost a decade. Dr. Coonan is currently a professor at New York University with appointments in the Stern School of Business, the Tandon School of Engineering, and the Department of Physics, and he was recently named as a senior fellow with the Hoover Institution at Stanford. Dr. Coonan's memberships include the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the Jason Group of Scientists Who Solve Technical Problems for the U.S. Government. He is the author of Unsettled, What Climate Science Tells Us, What It Does and why it matters, and since the book's release in April 2021, more than 200,000 copies have been sold. And I might add that we have both of uh, Dr. Wagner and Dr. Coonan's books are for sale in the uh, university bookstore. The bookstore, unfortunately, was unable to send someone over to sell books tonight because we would have loved to do a book signing for you. But you can buy both of those books, and I strongly encourage you to do so and read both of them so you can really understand uh, both of their positions as fully as possible. So let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Stephen Coonan. And finally, our moderator for this evening is Tom Rogan. Tom is an online editor and foreign policy writer for the Washington Examiner. He writes frequently on security and intelligence issues involving Russia, China, and the Middle East. He holds a Bachelor of Arts in War Studies from King's College London, a Master of Science in Middle East Politics from SOAS University of London, <clears throat> excuse me, and a Graduate Diploma in Law from the University of Law London. Among others, he's previously written for the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, Reuters, The Independent, The Atlantic, <coughs> pardon me, National Review, and The Guardian. And in 2014, Tom was selected as the inaugural Tony Blankley Fellow for Public Policy and American Exceptionalism by the Steamboat Institute. Tom, warm welcome for being here, and uh, I'm going to let you take it away. Great. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you. I'm sure you uh, all want to jump in here. Um, obviously, climate change is an issue now that is uh, incredibly topical and pertains both to environmental issues, but also economics, energy, um, profound questions. You think about the war in Ukraine as an example. It has a, uh, a connection point to climate change. But enough from me. I think let's, let's get straight into it. So the debate resolution tonight is, climate science compels us to make large and rapid reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. And the possible answers for all of you are yes, no, are undecided. You'll be able to vote uh, using the QR codes on your seat. Um, you'll also be able to submit questions, which I hope you'll do. Uh, because then at the end of the debate, we can get to it. Uh, but with that said, I'd like to invite Dr. Coonan uh, to make his opening statement. Well, the resolution sounds great. But in the real world, we have to balance scientific certainties and uncertainties against growing demand for reliable and affordable energy. In that light, the proposition fails dramatically. Large and rapid reductions are unjustified, immoral, and fantastical. 
I'll begin with compels, which makes the proposition unjustified. The UN estimates that we'll see as much warming in the next 100 years as we've already seen since 1900, about 1.3 degrees Celsius. Despite that warming, we have seen the greatest improvement ever in the human condition. Longevity, literacy, economic activity have all increased dramatically even as the population quintupled. And the rate of extreme poverty plummeted from 70% to 10%. Importantly, today's death rate from extreme weather is 1 50th of what it was in 1900. So it beggars belief that comparable warming over the next 100 years will significantly derail that progress. Many people allege that we've broken the climate, but it's hard to find long-term global trends in most extreme weather events, including storms, droughts, and floods. So global economic loss rates have actually declined slightly in the past 30 years, and they average a mere two-tenths of a percent of GDP. A wealthier world is a more resilient world. Well, maybe the future is going to be a lot worse. But the UN projects substantial economic growth even for an emissions-heavy scenario. In 2014, they said, for most economic sectors, the impact of climate change will be small relative to the impact of other drivers. Subsequent research confirms that warming is expected to be a minor drag on growth. A few degrees by the end of the century would make the growing economy a few percent smaller than it might have been. Of course, there are uncertainties in those projections. The GDP is not the only measure of well-being, and the rich will fare better than the poor. But the term existential crisis is not justified. One might still fret about severe but unlikely climate impacts. You hear something very bad might happen. We don't know exactly what, exactly when, or just how bad, but we'd better take drastic action. The well-to-do will clutch their pearls over that, but it's hardly compelling for most of the world. In fact, the word us in the proposition makes it immoral. The one and a half billion of us in the developed world enjoy abundant and affordable energy, but the globe's other six and a half billion are energy poor, and the inequalities are astounding. Americans consume about 30 times more energy per capita than Nigerians. And three billion people in the world use less electricity every year than does the average US refrigerator. Global energy demand is going to increase 50% by mid-century as most of the world develops. Fossil fuels are the most reliable and convenient way for developing nations to get that energy as they have long been for everyone. So when the proposition says science compels us, the developing world responds, what do you mean, us? The Indian prime minister protests closing the path for development, while the Nigerian president says Africa is being punished by the West and will fight to exploit the fossil resources that it has. It is, in fact, immoral for the developed world to deny developing nations the energy that they need. And it is the height of carbon colonialism to mandate costly and ineffective energy systems. Absolutes like science compels are also immoral. They induce echo anxiety. 60% of young people globally are very worried about climate change, and many are reluctant to have children. But the world isn't facing a climate catastrophe, so it's pernicious to rob young people of their optimism by exaggerating the importance and urgency of reducing emissions. Finally, the fantasy of large and rapid reductions. High reliability is one reason why energy systems change over decades. Large and rapid is highly problematic in that dimension, as well as in cost. Decarbonization means a zero emissions electrical grid powering just about everything. Solar panels and wind turbines are today the cheapest generation technologies, but you need a backup system for when there's no sun or wind. Technologies like natural gas with carbon capture or nuclear or some form of storage like giant batteries. Ensuring reliability is the costliest aspect of a renewables heavy grid. 
Achieving today's high reliability would more than double the cost of electricity. But reliability is only one of many oops issues as we careen toward a renewables heavy, all electric world. Solar and wind need an order of magnitude more land. They also need lots of stuff. Wind takes 10 times as much concrete and steel as does nuclear. And renewables use an order of magnitude more high value materials like copper, molybdenum, dysprosium, much of which today comes from inconvenient countries. Mineral supplies are going to have a hard time keeping up with large and rapid reductions. Lithium prices have already surged 750% in the past two years. And copper is expected to double in a decade. But the supply will still be 25% short because new mines will have poor quality ore and take 16 years to start up. So to sum up, the proposition is unjustified. There is no imminent climate catastrophe. We need not make large and rapid reductions. The proposition is also immoral. We cannot condemn most of humanity to expensive, inadequate energy. And so we shouldn't do it. And then finally, the proposition is fantastical. Large and rapid changes to energy systems will be expensive, disruptive, and counterproductive. So in fact, we can't do it. These are the points why you should soundly reject the proposition. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Wagner. Thank you. Um, you have seen the proposition before, so I will not read it again once it comes up. And in fact, jump right in. So yes, the first two words are climate science. Let's start with that and the very, very basics. Temperatures are up. Nobody denies that. But yes, there are often questions. So is it the Earth's orbit? One of the potential natural causes, and the answer is no. Is it the sun? It is not. Is it volcanoes? No, it's not. It isn't natural. Is it deforestation? Yeah, there are some effects, but no. Ozone? Nope. Aerosols? Tiny reflective particles, air pollution, basically? Yes, they have an effect. Lowering temperatures. Yes, it's greenhouse gases. And we can do one better. It's us. And yes, it's fossil fuels. Now, why am I starting with this? Because as recently as 2014, this time series ends in 2005. Steve Koenig here was saying, eh, it's about half-half. Half natural, half human. No, it is not. He was wrong back then. He is still wrong. Of course, science has moved on. Here is maybe one of the most amazing recent bits. Climate isn't weather, right? Everybody knows that. Well, turns out there is a link between climate and weather. And attribution climate science by now is so good that we can look at today's weather, tomorrow's weather, and figure out how much of it, how much of the higher than usual temperature, for example, is due to climate change, greenhouse gases, fossil fuels. How can we do that? We look at small shifts in the mean, the average, the most likely, and see how it changes the extremes, linking climate to weather. That isn't new either. Steve Coonan before was citing uh, the second to last assessment report, giving us some economic statistics that, of course, are outdated by now. Um, this is from 2007. Yes, we have known this quite a long time. It's not just what we know, it's actually the uncertainty, the tail end of the distribution. Right? For all the statistics students in the room, this is one of these PDFs, not what Adobe gives us, but a probability density function. It's the probability on the right-hand side here that matters, because it's heat that kills 
and lowers productivity. So yes, uncertainty actually makes things worse. Okay, now, this is the tricky bit. Science says, science tells us one of the three statements Steve was saying is not correct. Well, it's not. You all have a philosopher as president here at the university, or we can go back to your philosopher in the 18th century, David Hume. We can't derive an ought from an is. There are ethical judgments involved. Of course there are. There are politics. There is politics. There's economics. Well, luckily, I'm an economist. So let me start with lesson number one. Another philosopher, <laughs> Sir Michael Jagger, 1969. You can't always get what you want. Yes, there are trade-offs. Of course there are. It's our bread and butter. And guess what? Climate economists for three decades have looked at these trade-offs and developed something called the social cost of carbon, which is basically the summary of how much each ton of CO2 emitted today causes and damages over its lifetime in the atmosphere in today's dollars. Biden administration interim number, $50 can get into the details later, that number must be, should be, will be, given that we are in fact reviewing this at the federal level, at least twice as high. Here is a nature study that just came out last month, $185 per ton of CO2. And again, not to be pedantic about the statistics, but it doesn't matter as much what the mean, the median, the most likely tells us. It's the distribution. It's the uncertainty. It's the holy on the right-hand side. Here's another version of this. Happens to be one of my own papers. Economics, costs of climatic tipping points. Massive changes to the climate system. All you need to do is squint at this thing. We'll see this over and over again. It's not the gray. It's not the most likely. That's bad enough. But look at the fat tail on the right hand side. So yes, those are the costs of unmitigated climate change, or in other words, the benefits of cutting emissions. And yes, Sir Mick will tell us there are trade-offs. So we need to balance these costs, or benefits rather, of cutting emissions with the costs. Luckily for us, and now we are, in fact, at the latest IPCC report that came out this April. There are massive opportunities to cut emissions, lots of them, unreadable even. Here's the energy sector. So yeah, if you work in the energy sector and you are not focused on solar and wind, you are doing something wrong. The blue? Stuff that pays for itself, literally. Not just good for the planet, good for your pocketbook. Yes, the best answer to fossilflation is getting off fossil fuels, obviously. Energy sector, building sector, transport sector, over and over again, cutting CO2, greenhouse gases, fast and at scale, pays for itself. Steve mentioned the immoral aspect. Look at India. From last week, actually this year's data from last week's Economist. India leads the world in clean energy deployment. Why wouldn't they? Massive energy poverty, need for new energy? Solar happens to be the cheapest form of electricity in history. So yes, we can and we should. Thank you. And now, uh, Dr. Coonan, uh, your rebuttal, sir. A couple points about uh, some of the things Dr. V Wagner said. First of all, social cost of carbon. It depends a lot, as you saw, on what the discount rate is. And as Richard Newell certainly not uh, out of the mainstream of uh, mitigation exercises, uh, showed you can get pretty much any answer you want depending upon what you choose for the discount rate. Second, um, attribution. 
you know, this is an exercise where some weather event happens and some modelers set out to say, well, it's 38% more probable because there's greenhouse gases. The problem with that is you can never verify that. You can't check whether that's a good number or not. The only way to check it is if you had hundreds of storms, let's say, and 38% of them were uh, bigger than the others, all right? So it's entirely a reading of entrails. It's not science. We see no trend in extremes. Hurricanes, droughts, heat waves globally, nothing. All right, mid-latitude storms, nothing. That's not me, that's the IPCC. On fat tails, which Dr. Wagner seems quite fixated on, I'm prompted to recall a remark by William Thompson, Lord Kelvin, who was a famous physicist in the 19th century. And he said, unless you can put a number on something, your understanding is of the most meager and incomplete kind. And so, yes, you can say bad things might be happening, but unless you can tell me what the probability is of something bad and how bad it's going to be, it's not very useful. Right? And finally, on the morality issue, I, of course, went through Dr. Wagner's book, uh, Climate Shock, and I could find not one word about the energy poverty problem. And you didn't hear him say very much about that. All he said was, India is deploying a lot of solar. But compare that with how much coal India is deploying. Let me give you a number, which I read recently. It's quite interesting. The world spent almost $4 trillion in the last decade deploying renewable energy. You would think that's great, right? Well, it turns out that the fraction of fossil fuels providing the world's energy only dropped from 82% to 81% in those 10 years. Right? Four trillion dollars. So yeah, there's a lot of wind and solar going up. It's measured by capacity, by the way, not by generating. Nevertheless, there's a lot more fossil fuels going on, and there's a reason for that. It's because it is most reliable and convenient as these developing countries try to get their energy. Thank you. I love when names are being mentioned out of left field. Richard Newell, one of the co-authors of the paper I just showed you, $185 per ton of CO2. Uh, uh, yes, I did. Um, and it's exactly the uncertainty, the not knowing, because guess what? We can cut off the tail on the left-hand side. Adding CO2 isn't going to decrease temperatures despite some people's best attempts to try to teach us that. That's 19th century science. And on the right-hand side, unfortunately, we are not as lucky. And yes, it's the, un the not knowing that, in fact, drives that outcome. Now, just to be clear, I know the term uncertain is horrible in this context. Scientists know that uncertainty is worse than risk. Not to bring us back to basic statistics here, but risk is deck of cards, 52 different cards. What's your probability of picking one? One in 52. Uncertainty, you don't know how many cards are on the deck. Might be some missing. Yes, it's worse than risk. Now, when you say it in English, or German accented English, but English nonetheless, <laughs> What you have is uncertainty tells you, oh, don't quite know, wait and see. What do we do if stuff is risky? You take out insurance, you manage, you mitigate risk. So guess what? When Frank Luntz, famed Republican pollster, is trying to counsel the Bush 43 White House what to do, he says, emphasize the uncertainty. And folks like Steve Conan fall into line and write books with titles like Unsettled as a result. You keep citing the IPCC. Yeah, I do too. I cite assessment report six. Working groups two and three came out this spring. You keep citing assessment report five. Well, I, I cited six when I told Not on your slides, but okay. Um, now, why do we still deploy coal if uh, 
low carbon technologies, and yes, I would count nuclear as part of the low carbon technologies, of course, are so good. Why is there still coal around? As far as I can tell, Steamboat is all about free market capitalism, right? 97% of coal is locked into long-term contracts on average longer than 20 years, i.e. subsidized. It's us paying for keeping coal around. No, it wouldn't survive on its own. Solar is the cheapest form of electricity in history, full stop. Wind is cheaper. Solar plus batteries is cheaper. Thank you very much. Yes, the sun doesn't shine at night. I know that. My nine-year-old knows that. Um, but yes, there are solutions. And yes, the prices are plummeting. And yes, let's please move in the 21st century and not stay in the 19th or 20th. Thank you. So one of the areas that I think both both of our panelists have talked about is the the balancing of uncertainties uh, and the assessment of potential economic gains losses and I'm curious um, Dr. Coonan one of the retorts to you might be that uh, if we look at Pascal's wager or the potential cataclysmic costs over the longer term perhaps not in 10 years perhaps not even in 50 why shouldn't we endorse some of the changes uh, that have been you know, proven to work in terms of expanded solar. And, and to you, Dr. Wagner, uh, when we talk about the uncertainties of um, the data points, one of the certainties, certainties that we do see, uh, for example, in states like California, which have pushed, made a big push for green energy, um, is high uh, price points uh, for energies for consumer. Um, and at the same time, we have seen blackouts. And so there's a certainty in that that has a moral Point. Do no blackouts in Texas, right? No, well, but, but the blackouts in California seem to be more significant in, with the price points. Uh, but anyway, in on the that, room here, but sure. Uh, but how do we approach this? this yeah, uncertainty so, uh, you know, when you think about risk and uncertainty in wagers, I think a lot depends upon where you stand. Um, you know, if I'm sitting in Lagos or Jakarta, I'm probably more worried about having enough energy to be able to run my fridge or run my lights so I don't have to study by candlelight. And this vague thing that's several generations away, you know, I'll take that bet, okay? It's not to say we should not pay attention to greenhouse gas emissions, but you gotta take care of the more immediate, tangible, and soluble problems first. There is a May I respond to that? Just, just one follow-up, though, uh, Dr. Kuhn, you know, the, the Pentagon uh, uh. would say, and, and really this is something that isn't just a, a Biden administration focus, a lot of senior military officers would say they believe climate change is a national security concern now yeah. because of, isn't that a, a, a certainty that we should uh, look at if we're talking about national defense concerns? Yeah, so, so I talked to a lot of four stars, um, and... Uh, They'll say something in private that you don't hear in public. Otherwise, they get fired. Okay? Okay. All right. <laughs> don't survive them. Um, you mentioned a couple developing country capitals right now. You have checked the news the last few weeks, right? Pakistan floods, Nigeria floods. Um, now, no, one more solar panel isn't going to prevent that flood. I bet that's your retort. Um, but that's not a very profound statement. So, of course, okay, the rich will adapt. Newsflash. We'll buy a second air conditioner. Take the private jet up to Aspen if Houston is underwater. Okay, fine. It's the poor who suffer. Every single social issue. Why should climate change be any different? Um, we currently kill 8 to 10 million people per year because of air pollution. I mentioned before, right, air pollution, aerosols, tiny reflective particles. Yes, they're deadly. They also reflect sunlight back into space and cools what's underneath. So no, it's not all bad, as Sir Mick would tell us. Sure, can't always get what you want. There are trade-offs in life. But your answer to energy poverty is to say, 
here's some outdated technology that we know is causing asthma. And by the way, it's more expensive and less reliable too than the cheaper alternative. But here we go. Well, how we don't want it anymore. So one of the first things I teach my climate class at NYU, when you mentioned it, weather is not climate. You mentioned the Pakistani floods. And we heard the Pakistani environmental minister a few days after the flood saying, this is the worst flood we've seen since 1961. And I teach my class to think critically about these things. And so we looked up the record of the monsoon over the last 150 years. And yeah, the monsoon was wet in today, and it was wet in 1961, but in the longer record, it's not unusual. Given that human influences were a lot smaller before 1950, blaming one year of flooding on greenhouse gases does not make any scientific sense. The problems in Pakistan were many more people living in floodplains where they should not have been living, and poor hydrology building up too much pavement that caused all the flooding. Okay, um, again, welcome to 21st century statistics. Um, when you go to check the probability of an event being caused by mm -hmm. adding energy, adding CO2, adding greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, it is in fact a probability statement. It's a probabilistic statement. No, Harvey hitting Houston was not quote unquote caused by climate change. There have been hurricanes before. Yes, we all know that. Are hurricanes getting, statistically speaking, more intense? Yes, no. they are. No. Uh, ask Kerry Emanuel. I have yes, written, I've are. read Kerry's most um, recent paper. He acknowledges that in the North Atlantic, whatever intensification we have seen is simply a return to normal from the 1960s. Okay. We can pull uh, up the slides if you're interested. Are hurricanes getting more intense according to the sixth assessment report yes, of the IPCC? Yes. There was a subsequent but. Let's paper. Get the but. There was a subsequent yes. paper by um, Gabe Vecchi from GFDL that mm -hmm. did a reconstruction and they show that hurricane intensity went down in 1960 and then recovered from 1980. So they say it's a return to normal. Okay. S and Kerry agrees. Okay. Um, Kerry's currently writing a 2,500 word paper saying just that for a well, I'll look uh, for, I'll look general to audience it. so the rest of us can I'll understand it to too. It. And okay. yes, hurricane intensity is in fa hurricanes are in fact intensifying. But yet again, we are basically debating the past here, well, apparently. If you're going to say I'm that greenhouse gases are destroying the climate already, you mm -hmm. had better look at what the recent trends are. And yes. for most so extreme events, there's nothing going on. Okay, um, so when statisticians look at Harvey hitting Houston and yep. say there is a two-thirds, 60-ish percent probability that, um, or 60 percent of the effects of Harvey, sorry, um, are in fact due to climate change, i.e. Harvey would have been less intense were it not for climate. You are shaking your head because you don't That's believe science. the statistic? That is well, statistics, statistics is science. You have a lot of cases and you can do statistics, uh, okay? Yes, you have and... one event, that's not statistics. Okay. And it relies um, on models that the modelers themselves say, do not trust the models for this. Okay. Okay? Uh, you may want to put up your mic so the people watching at home can hear you too. Do not um, trust the, you know, Hannah Nissan at Columbia, mm -hmm. Bjorn Stevens, mm -hmm. Tim Palmer, all say you cannot trust the models below regional resolution. All right, well, let's, let's have Dr. Wagner finish on this point, so we okay. want to move on Let's to a, on. another question. Okay, um, 
and the flip and answer would be welcome to 21st century statistics. Unfortunately, we have had so many of these events that yes, this is a very recent advancement in climate science. 10 years ago, we weren't able to do these things. Now we are. Um, now, um, actually, let me stop there and, and then move on. But, but maybe sort of just like when you go to this, um, attribution and basically say, wait a second, you can in fact calculate the cost per ton of CO2. That is 30 years ago by now that we are able to sort of say, hey, we can wrap our minds around and start doing the calculation. And by now we know that those costs are much, much higher then, for example, the Nobel Prize winning work of three years ago, or the Nobel Prize given out three years ago, would lead us to believe. Um, so yes, it is in fact important to look at, let's say, the last paper on these, September, last month, as opposed to go back to IPCC reports circa 2014, in your case, to make economic statements. Uh, on the economic impact. I know about is Richard Toll's analysis in which he surveyed many dozen economic models. And Speaking as you know, statistics. Uh, as you know, there is a class of models that, dis that disagree wildly with the others and basically give uncontrolled answers. Okay. All right. Um, uh, right well, let, let, let's, let's, let me let's do very quickly because I do want to go. Very quickly. Me. So for the rest of us. Richard Toll is um, a character, let's put it this way. He used to be a Twitter icon called Richard Troll, and this was fantastic. Um, now, um, what he does is completely agnostically look at every paper ever published on the social cost of carbon. And yes, there's some crackpot answers for minus 10,000, and some go all the way into the hundreds of thousands. And he agnostically looks at this and says, let's figure out what the distribution is. That that's the definition of bad No, statistic. that's not what he did. He segregated the models and showed that there is a certain class that give consistent answers of a few percent for a warming of four degrees, right. whereas right. another class of models does not. All right, well, there's a, there's a disagreement on this point. Well, one fact we can agree on, I think everyone hopefully could agree on, is that we know carbon output based on each nation. What is each nation putting out each year? And we know that China is putting out the most carbon. And we know that China has committed from 2030, it says it will try and commit to reducing its emissions at a cap basis that level. What would be, uh, uh, Dr. Wagner, your response to Americans who would say, why should we undertake what at least in the short term will be painful transitions in cost and employment perhaps, uh, certainly in the economy, if China has is building hundreds of new coal plants each year, uh, and based on the nature of the regime, perhaps we should be skeptical of its commitments to do something from 2030. What would be your response to that? Okay, well, one response would be, um, how many people live in the US, and how many live in China? So yes, of course. Um, it's a question of global equality, global ethics, and ultimately politics, of course. Now here's what else is going on in China. Two thirds of all solar panels on the planet produced in China. Over two thirds of all lithium batteries produced in China. Almost half of all wind turbines produced in China. The Economist, the magazine, puts from petrostate to electrostate on its cover for good reason. No, not every one of these moves is good, which by the way is why we have things like the Inflation Reduction Act in this country. $300 billion of investment to build these kinds of manufacturing capacities domestically. We have the Chips and Science Act, $50 billion for the microchips industry in this country. Of course, it's a clean energy race. It truly is. My accent name comes from Austria. Austria, in response to the Inflation Reduction Act, passed a 5.7 billion euro, 6 billion bucks, subsidy bill, which if you divide by Austrians, which we have to do, much like with the Chinese here, is approximately the exact same amount as we in this country are spending through the Inflation Reduction Act. 
Yes, it's a race. Yes, when I pull up my Austrian passport, I feel one way. When I pull up my American passport, I feel the other way. Because economically, of course, it's a competition. Now, it's a race to the top in terms of emissions reductions, which makes me feel hopeful no matter what passport I pull out. And that's the point. This is the future, the clean energy future. And yes, the more we deploy, the cheaper the stuff per unit is going to get. We are climbing the learning curves, we are sliding right. down the cost curves. Let, let's bring in Dr. Kuhnen. So you mentioned the Inflation Reduction Act, right? Uh, some of it's pretty good. A lot of it is unconscionable. You mentioned that wind and solar are the cheapest sources of electricity. I agree. On the other hand, the Inflation Reduction Act has, I don't know, $60 billion of investment and production tax credits for wind and solar. The tax credits reduce the cost of wind and solar to zero. And that means anybody who invests, and it's mostly the wealthy, will reap an enormous amount of money by doing something that under a free market, you should think what they'd be doing anyway. So that's tens of billions of dollars adding to inflation and not doing much good. Um, well, not adding to inflation turns out because when you look at what causes inflation currently, it is in fact high fossil fuel prices. When you put more money um, in the economy, the in inflation is going to go up. Uh, okay, thank you for explaining economics to me. Well, uh, thank you for the doing the same to me. Okay. Uh, I'm the economist, I'd, yes. I'd be happy let's to explain let's, physics let's, to you and statistics, yes. if you like. Uh, sure, um, 20th century statistics, no thank you. Uh, uh, it was very, it reduction, still works. Inflation Reduction Act. When you look at what causes inflation this year. Newsflash, February 24th actually did happen this year. The reminder that was the invasion. Land war in Europe, first one in 75 years, war of aggression, and so on and so forth. So yes, when you look at what drives inflation, or especially drove inflation for the first few months after that, no longer fully the case, but almost half of higher prices overall is directly due to increases in fossil fuels, okay. fossil inflation. I, I want to make Much sure of the other, the rest is indirectly driven by just uh, that. And, and I hate to be like a right, right. well, cloak, but how, what's the best way to get off fossil inflation? To address fossil inflation, you get off fossil. Okay, fuel. you know, Do Dr. Yeah, Dr. Yeah, uh, Cooney, on, on your response as well, though, if you could touch on China, because yeah. I think that I think that would be a beneficial. So, so uh, a there are many contributing factors to the rise in fossil fuels. One is, as you correctly point out, um, Ukraine and the Russian shocks to the market. A second is a rebound from the pandemic. And a third is the discouragement of US production by the present administration. When you have a president who, campa who campaigned on a promise to kill fossil fuels, Nobody's going to invest any money. And so U.S. production, investment has gone down enormously. I think the world is getting a reality uh, check right now, and you're going to see it go back up. On China, um, the Chinese are making very interesting progress in um, small nuclear reactors. Uh, and yes, that disturbs me a lot. But they have a very deliberate and thoughtful approach to hitting their emissions goals. And that's very different from the hair on fire climate catastrophe rhetoric that we hear in the US. And so, you know, I don't always trust them. Hong Kong is a great example where China promises one thing and does something else eventually. Uh, on the other hand, um, the thoughtful approach that they have is not bad. Wouldn't one area of compromise That's here an be? I didn't a, a, expect. Wouldn't one one area of compromise here though be uh, just a, a tripling, a quadrupling down on nuclear power? Okay. If we, if you know that that over a longer term, you know, it's affordable. Uh, the risk quotient uh, is not as high as perhaps Chernobyl and HBO would present. Um, is that an area of compromise that would? Uh, 
what do you mean compromise? So we're trying to get off fossil fuels, lower greenhouse gases, and yes, nuclear is a low carbon technology. Would you so would you weight that against solar and wind as a compromise method? It, let's say if you know Republic, you were in Congress. Because, Republicans. Why? Because wind and solar sound too well because of the transmission or? difficulties, because of the weather uh, challenges that can accrue to that, because of. Um, Construction, uh, you know, Cape Cod doesn't want it off their backyard. Those, those kind of factors. Um, so Cape Cod might not want it, but there's a reason why Texas is the state with the largest deployment of renewables east of the Rockies, because it makes sense. It makes economic sense. Now, would it make sense to keep old nuclear reactors around for longer? Yes, of course. Happy to turn up my German accent. Yes, Germany made a mistake phasing out nuclear, especially phasing out nuclear before coal, of course. But there are a few separate issues here. There's keeping old reactors around for longer. Yes, those that can be kept around safely, sure. Then there is the question of should we be building new nuclear? Well, yes, we should. It takes a long time. It is, in fact, expensive. So no, it certainly is no replacement for rapid deployment of renewables. And then third, should we invest in R&D? Yes, of course we should invest in R&D. How else are you going to climb the learning curve and slide, slide down the cost curve? So uh, you know, there's a little bit of confusion here. Um, as I tried to point out in my remarks, the reliability of the grid is the most expensive part. Wind and solar can be a supplement, but they can never supplant firm generation. Nuclear is the cheapest form of firm generation. I'm a nuclear physicist, so you know I, I love the atom. Um, but do not believe that you can get away with just wind and solar. I hesitate to introduce a German word because I don't speak German, but I'll try. Dunkelflaute, right? <laughs> you can correct my pronunciation. What it means is, and you, again you can correct me, a dark stillness. There are periods in the UK and in Germany that happen often enough that the Germans gave it a word, and it means dark stillness. Up to two weeks where wind and solar do not generate. And if wind and solar are the backbone of your grid, you're in deep trouble. That's why you need to have nuclear, gas, storage on standby to ride through those times. And that's very expensive. Obviously, at least twice as expensive as wind if wind is the cheapest. Okay, let, let, let's jump to some audience questions here because we're running out of time. Um, Dr. Kuhn, I'm going to start on this one for you. Um, if we don't actually need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, why does the vast majority of the scientific community tell us that we need to? Yeah, you know, I would not say that we don't need to. It's a question of pace and scale. And if we took 100 years, I think that would actually be OK. But this drive to go to zero by 2050, which is not going to happen, even John Kerry says that's not going to happen, I think it's going to be a re heroic effort to get to zero by 2100. We should not disrupt everything in the service of that goal. Okay. Uh, Dr. Wagner, um, how do you, actually let's do this one, is solar and um, wind energy reliable to sustain the U.S. getting off fossil fuels? And if so, why is California experiencing so many energy problems? Kind of expounds on a point we made. Uh, so again, the most recent actual blackout that affected people in this room, probably, was here in Texas. It was fuel shortage for coal and especially gas plants because stuff froze. So if we're talking about reliability, uh, sorry, uh, we just had a hurricane hit Florida. There's this one, literally, uh, this one subdivision of some suburb, um, you can hear the New York snark here, right? Single family homes outside cities, right? Um, that alone is, by the way, amazing, right? You have two New York guys fly down here and to uh, argue about the climate. Um, so there is one subdivision 
that had electricity throughout the whole thing. Why? Built to basically German passive house standards on the one hand, and on the other, solar panels. Now, yes, turns out the sun doesn't shine at night. Yes. Again, not the news flash. And yes, the wind doesn't blow sometimes. That's why we need storage. And yes, there are lots of different possibilities to do that. There are hydro plants where you literally pump the water up when the wind blows and the sun shines and then the water comes shooting down and produces electricity. If you have the right mountains, you can do that. There are molten salt reactors, there is nuclear, there is lots of other possibilities to provide that firm energy. There is gas and carbon capture and storage, big component of the Inflation Reduction Act too. Subsidies to basically suck CO2 back out of, in this case, the smokestack. And yes, we are so far along, we also need to suck it back out of thin air. That's part of the solution. Not the primary solution, also part of it. And yes, then there's just the regular old batteries. Um, maybe just very quickly, I forget the guy's name now. Congressperson, the guy who that puts his family on a Christmas card with every kid with a, with a machine gun. Remember that last Christmas? So rabbit one-sider, let's put it that way. Um, and then he is the one congressperson who has a completely independent home at home. What? He took a Tesla, an old Tesla battery of a total Tesla, did it himself, put solar panels on his roof, and has the most reliable, grid-independent uh, energy system at home. Not for environmental reasons in this case. In this case, of course, for other reasons. Yes, it's reliable if you uh, design it the right way. Yes, it also costs money to do so. Okay. Of course it does, but like you say, reliability is expensive. Yes. Um, Kudin, do you want to jump on so, this so I'm glad you finally mentioned cost. Uh, I was surprised as an economist. That's you what my first with, eight minutes started I, you with. You didn't right? start but with that, okay? All of those things are more costly than wind and solar, and so the cost of the grid goes up at least by a factor of two. Let me address Texas for a moment. The failure in Texas was not due to fossil fuels. It was a failure to weatherize the gas system. In Oklahoma, one state to the north, they get through just fine because they have regulations that require a weatherization of power plants. Texas works on a completely unconstrained market. There was no incentive for anybody to weatherize. It's certainly possible well within the realm of technology. And oh, by the way, during the freeze, the wind gave out entirely. Did I just hear that the regulation was a good thing? Yes. <laughs> some. Some. A light hand. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I, I want to touch on the, this issue of China that we mentioned earlier. Obviously, a, quite a lot of the solar panels, one of the controversies has been that they're produced in Xinjiang, where um, the Uyghur peoples have been subjected to a genocide. But more broadly with China, uh, the US and China really locked in a really, I would say, extremely serious security challenge at the moment of Taiwan and different issues. Is, is, is there a, a degree to which um, the, the climate negotiation process, and um, certainly John Kerry, the climate czar, has suggested it should be front and center, but what would you say to those people, Doctor, who say, uh, actually, at least in the near term, we need to put security interests with China before cooperation on climate? Well, to be clear, that's why it was so surprising that Steve essentially bowed down before the Chinese and said they have it all figured out. Uh, no, they don't. Um, now, uh, let me just try to answer your question in sort of a slightly different way, right? Europe dependent on Russian gas. Isn't the rest of the world dependent on Chinese solar panels? Well, up to a point, yes. Cue the Inflation and Carbon Reduction Act. Yes, of course, that's what that is all about. Now, here is a key difference. When you have a fossil-based energy system, you rely on those fossil fuels. You rely on the commodity. Your plant doesn't run when the Russians turn off the gas pipeline. What happens if we install Chinese solar panels and then we go to war with China? 
not going to get any more solar panels from China probably after we've started the war. But guess what? Those solar panels we just installed are still producing electricity. So yes, of course there are trade-offs. Of course there are there's a balancing act between national security and lots and lots of other concerns. Duh. Mick Jagger was right. Sure. But come on. At the end of the day, we know that cheap, reliable, and clean are three competing priorities. And of course, the question is which one to emphasize, which one to de emphasize or compromise on. Again, there are trade offs. But when we are so behind on the decarbonization front, then yes, of course, the name of the game is to say, wait, maybe we should do something about those regulations locking us into inefficient, inexpensive, non-weatherized coal and gas power that would in fact make sense to replace sooner rather than later because it makes economic sense to do so. So when Dr. Wagner says we are so behind, that implies an urgency that is paramount. You know, there's kind of a Maslow's hierarchy of energy needs. Reliable first or available, affordable second, and clean third. And I would ask you all, would you sacrifice reliability and affordability for greenhouse gas emissions? No. Okay? Absolutely not. All right? So the world will get to greenhouse gas emissions, but it's going to take a long time, and we will eventually get there. Whether we need to or not is another issue. So free market, rah, rah, but if it locks in the inefficient coal power, are we I, okay I with that? I didn't say free market, did I? Don't put words in my mouth, please. Is it, uh, okay? Dr. Wagner, on that point of uh, the efficiency of certain sources, isn't there a legitimacy to what Dr. Kuhn said in terms of uh, one of the reasons, a significant reason perhaps, that solar and wind uh, are able to be um, commercially viable is the uh, increasingly large subsidies that are provided to them. No, solar is cost comp It's the cheapest form of electricity in history without those subsidies. Wind is increasingly cheap. And by the way, the so we heard, the since network. we are talking costs, so we heard a little bit about you know, uh, was it lithium and copper and so on, and oh, the cost increases. Oh. So for example, yes, this year, Earlier this year, solar panels were suddenly about 20% more expensive than the year prior. Okay, that's bad news, right? Turns out fossil fuels were that much more expensive, two times, three times than the year prior, that on a relative basis, the only one that matters, it's all about relative prices, solar was even cheaper than ever before in human history. Yes, of course those costs matter. Of course the economics matter. Frankly, that's what makes me so hopeful on this. That's what makes this a clean energy race toward the top. We're not going to unlearn on the technology front. Commodity prices fluctuate. Every 10 years again, we are suddenly surprised. OMG, prices are up again. Whoa, look at the Saudis, what they're up to. Um, technology, solar panels, cost a tenth now than did it 10 years all right, ago. Let's, so let's bring so that's great. What they did for And then we ago. should cut all subsidies for solar and wind because it is the cheapest and people will do it. Okay, fossil fuels first. Yeah, what subsidies go to fossil fuels per kilowatt hour? Overall, yeah. when you actually add it yep. all up, yep. and I'm not even talking yep. about the implicit subsidies of Tax. not incorporating the pollution, yes, yes, but just the subsidies yes. themselves, yes, fossil fuels, yep, coal, yep. the long-term contracts, US six billion dollars a year um, in the U.S. alone, yep, okay, government numbers, cool. 
government globally government. IMF I don't know we are talking okay. okay we'll be good to look that up once yep. one of right. these days yep. about half a trillion dollars yeah, okay. worth of subsidies yeah, that's globally. wrong okay so, okay we shouldn't be doing cool. that all right but we shouldn't be subsidizing solar and wind in this country if it's the cheapest okay so we are not in fact interested in climbing the learning Didn't curve Didn't say that didn't okay. say that. If it's the cheapest, people are going to do it. And you'll come down the learning curve by itself. That's the way it's supposed to work. Um, well, The reason no. people don't deploy wind and solar is because they take a lot of land, they take a lot of permitting, and they are unreliable. Okay, I see I hit a sore spot here. So um, let's start with Econ 101 very quickly. One minute, sorry. Econ 101 basically says that there, if there are negative externalities, so, sorry to use that word, but basically right, external effects that you don't account for. That's the social cost of carbon business. That's basically saying pay for your own damn pollution. Right? That's the Econ 101 version, and that's the reason why we have to price CO2 greenhouse gases in the first place. Right? Econ 102 says subsidize the good stuff. Why? Because there are also positive externalities. There are positive spillovers. There are learning by doing effects. The first solar panel to install, extremely expensive. Rufa looks at the thing, doesn't know which way is up. The thousandth solar panel, the millionth solar panel, of course, is a lot cheaper for all the right reasons. That's learning by doing. And yes, it takes getting to Econ 102 to realize that, but yes, that takes up the, the incremental solar panels or wind globally that will be induced by the IRA are small potatoes on the learning curve. You know, it's real interesting. You can look at wind installation as a function of the PTC and ITC, and it goes Production up and curve. down. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, all right. So I'm actually, we're going to, let's go to the closing statements, okay. if that's all right, gentlemen. Uh, so, Dr. Coonan, actually, who have we got here? We're Dr. Dr. Wagner. Sorry, Dr. Wagner is first on the closing statement. Okay. Um, may I stay here? Oh, uh, sure. Yeah, let's do the prefer. slides. That's fine. I think you're okay. Um, yeah. Make sure when you, you've heard the uh, closing statements to do your votes, because we're going to compare the polls at the beginning and at the end. Okay, um, so let's start with the politics. Or let's start sort of with the punchline, which is, of course, all of this is about value judgments. Of course, all of it is about politics. Even the supposedly scientific reports are. Again, this is the latest IPCC report, not the second last IPCC report. Uh, in some sense, you can ignore the details, but of course, do read it if you're interested. There's a difference between what the scientists come up with and then what ends up being the summary for policymakers, very, very much written by those policymakers as well. What's the difference? Value judgments, politics. Those value judgment and politics, in fact, lead to extremes sometimes. I'm not showing this gleefully here. This is horrible. Because, for example, it leads to things like this. Yes, New York City was hit hardest at first, and that is bad. My wife, by the way, is a gynecologist at Bellevue, the public hospital. That's pretty darn bad news. Yes. Look at the other stuff over there. That is basically us saying, science, meh. That's a real problem. Here's a global view, a very brief global view of this. Unfortunately, the US is in fact almost unique in this science denial. And yes, of course, climate science denial is very much part of the equation. Again, yes, there's two New Yorkers coming down here talking about climate. None of this is good news. It really isn't. Okay, let me just 
end on a slightly more positive note. There is a revolution happening. There truly is. There is a revolution happening where the incumbents, the old guys, have a hard time catching up. Look at the left, solo deployment. Massive, rapid solo deployment. And year after year, the International Energy Agency looks, says, oh, here's our projections. And year after year, of course, we exceed these expectations globally with solar PV deployment. That's good news. The thing on the right is also good news. What's that? Decrease in coal. And same thing, in this case it's the US EIA, not IEA in this case, the Energy Information Administration. Keeps projecting, oh, you know, we're just gonna keep exporting, producing coal. No, we're not. It's in fact on its way down, despite the massive regulations locking in 97% of coal power plants into long-term contracts. So yes, all of this is good news. This energy revolution is good news. It is driven by and it is driving these massive price decreases. That's learning by doing. Yes, up to a point it deserves subsidies. And yes, most of these technologies by now can fly on their own and fly they do. Yes, even the war, the war in Europe, lots of wars in the world turns out, but Ukraine drives that even more so. Not just when the Ukrainian prime minister goes to Brussels as happened two nights ago and essentially says, we want to get off Russian fossil fuels, please help us. Part of the rebuilding effort here, in fact, do this sooner rather than later. High energy prices, high fossil energy prices, of course are driving this transition even more so. So here's perhaps the best good news. If you can read this, the first two bullet points here. 2019, fossil fuels supplied 83% of primary energy globally. That same year, Non-fossil, 85% of the addition. Since then, all of the addition on net, of course, in non-fossil. This revolution is in fact happening. It's good, and yes, it's about speeding it up and scaling it up even more so. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Wagner. And Dr. Koenig. The economist Anthony Downs wrote in 1972 about the arc of public attention given to any issue. After bubbling along among experts, an issue burst with alarm into public consciousness, accompanied by euphoric enthusiasm for solving the problem. But after a while, people realize just how hard it's going to be, and then there's a gradual decline in interest. Climate action, which really means emissions reductions, implied by the proposition, I would assert, has been well into phase three and is starting to enter phase four. Here's why. The ongoing energy crisis has demonstrated the primacy of reliable and affordable energy over greenhouse gas emissions. Coal consumption has soared and the world is clamoring for gas. Even Europeans can now say the two F words, fission and fracking. Physical and economic realities eventually prevail. Second, polls show that many other issues are far more important to the US electorate than climate change, including inflation and the breakdown of public discourse. Think about what will happen as climate action starts to impact ordinary folks through energy costs, reliability, and restrictions on choice. Third, the bloom is coming off ESG investing. Among the reasons are no agreed upon ESG metrics, lower returns, 3% lower, and little demonstrable impact, as I mentioned, We've spent almost $4 trillion over the last decade and managed to drop the energy curve for fossil fuels by only 1% from 82 to 81. 
banks and funds are seriously rethinking or even withdrawing from their mitigation pledges. Finally, ill-considered efforts to radically transform vital systems have been damaging, failures. The Sri Lankan president banned chemical fertilizers in that country in April 2021, motivated by environmental considerations. That quickly crashed the Sri Lankan economy, leading to starvation, riots, and a change in government. Foreign Policy magazine described that tragedy as a farrago of magical thinking, technocratic hubris, ideological delusion, self-dealing, and sheer short-sightedness. Similar circumstances are already playing out in Germany, in the UK, in California, and here in Texas, where hasty and ill-conceived greening of the energy system has degraded reliability and increased costs. Those are cautionary examples of why precipitous emissions reductions are much more risky than any climate change itself. We have to be very careful in tinkering with energy systems. So there are multiple reasons to reject the proposition. It is unjustified. The official science in the UN and US government reports, as well as common sense, belie that we have a crisis. Rapidly reducing carbon dioxide emissions won't reduce human influences anytime soon. We have ample time to develop technology and think through any large scale actions. It is immoral. If you support the proposition, please check your privilege, unless you have a way of getting that energy to six and a half billion people without fossil fuels. I haven't heard a way. It's immoral also to rob young people of their optimism. And finally, the proposition is a techno-economic fantasy. It would take the energy system rapidly in an unnatural direction, degrading the quality of energy services and leading to more disruption and destitution than any climate change itself. Last week, President Xi told the party Congress in China that that nation would pursue its emission goals with prudence in line with the principle of getting the new before discarding the old. That scares me because, as I said, it's a lot more sensible than the planet on fire rhetoric that we're hearing from the politicians and the media. So each of these three points, unjustified, immoral, and fantastical, would warrant a rejection of the proposition. Taken together, they warrant a resounding projection. Rejection, projection. Thank you very much. Uh, all right, well, thank you very much, panelists. So now we get to the uh, exciting moment of the results. And first, I'm going to just tell you what uh, the votes were before uh, the debate started, which was, and again, the uh, resolution, uh, the motion. Climate change science compels us to make large and rapid reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. 37% of the audience agreed. 37% of the audience disagreed. And 20... 6% of the audience uh, was undecided. So now we shall see the final outcome, hopefully. All right. Well, it looks like the, uh, the resolution has not passed. Um, so some shifting votes. It looks like some of the undecideds went quite. Oh, it's still going. Anyway, a very good debate. Jennifer? <laughs> First, thank you, Dr. Wagner, Dr. Coonan, for uh, agreeing to get on a debate stage. Not everyone will do what the two of you did, so thank you. Can we have a round of applause for our panelists? <laughs> thank, thank you, Tom Rogan, for making the trip out from Washington to moderate. Um, I would like to thank the University of Dallas, President Sanford. Your team has been great to work with. And to the Sumner's Foundation, thank you so much for your support of this evening's debate. For the Sumner scholars who are here, before uh, everyone goes upstairs to the third floor for the reception, which, by the way, you're all invited to the reception. You can come up and visit with our speakers. I'd like to get the Sumner scholars up here to get a, a photo, a group photo with the speakers. Um, 
I, I did want you to know, too, um, Dr. Wagner, you made a, a good point about why did we invite two New York guys down here to, to Dallas? Well, we, we did try to get uh, a professor from Texas Tech who couldn't join us because we did want to have that Texas perspective for one of the panelists. Uh, that I individual was unable to join us. Uh, tomorrow night in Oklahoma City, we do have Andrew Dessler from Texas A&M who will be up in Oklahoma City, but his schedule didn't allow him to be here. So, um, But I, th I thought the two New York guys did pretty good. So, so um, we, we, were, we were happy to have them. Um, yes. Also, um, our, uh, there's the editor of your student newspaper is here. Kate, I know you want to get an interview with the speaker. So right after we get the photo, we'll let you ask, ask the gentleman some questions. Uh, last thing, the debate videos will be up in their entirety, all three debates from this week on our YouTube channel next week. It's, the whole thing is there. Feel free to watch, share with your networks. And if you see value in the debates we host, Steamboat Institute always appreciates your support um, as a nonprofit organization that puts these on around the country. So thank you very much, and we hope to see you upstairs at the debate, and thanks again for coming tonight.